Well, please turn first to Hebrews chapter 6 as we continue our exposition of the epistle to the Hebrews. Uh, I'm going to read the first 12 verses, but we will consider verses 4 um, four to 9 particularly. After that, we will uh, consider Luke 8, 4 through 15, so be prepared to turn there as we have two scripture readings this afternoon. So, Hebrews 6, verse 1. Please give your attention again to the reading of God's holy word. These are the very words of God. Let us receive them as they are holy and infallible. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. And I'll read one more verse. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience Inherit the promises. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Turn back to Luke. And Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 4. This is the parable of the, the soils. Let's give our attention again to the reading of his word. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? And he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. They on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come to the preaching of the word, which we heard, if it is faithful, is to be received as the very word of God. And what a sober thing that is to consider when we consider the texts before us. So Father, we pray that your spirit would enable the preacher to preach faithfully, to preach as these are in truth the words of God, that you would keep him from error, that you would keep him from presumption, you'd keep him from sinful thoughts, but instead preach the very counsel of God. And we pray as well that those who hear would hear the voice of God in the scriptures 
and that they would test it against the truth and examine whether these are indeed the things that are so out of the Scriptures, and having done so, that they would receive it as the Word of God themselves and be conformed to it. Father, in all these things, we pray that Jesus Christ would be high and lifted up among us. You say, Is not my word like as a fire, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? O Lord, help us to say by the Spirit's help, It is. So smash our stony hearts, and make your word as fire in our hearts that we would receive it. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, this past week I actually learned this, and uh, at least one of you were there when I learned this, that if you renounce your American citizenship, you will never, ever again be a citizen of the United States. It is irreversible. Irreversible. You renounce your United States citizenship, you will never, ever get it back. On Friday, I heard of a man who renounced his U.S. citizenship rashly in a fit of anger, who now regrets it because it is irreversible. And he will never be a citizen of the United States ever again. In the same way, this text is a solemn warning. You renounce Jesus Christ, and it is irreversible that you will never be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Heaven will be shut to you, and your soul will be so hardened that you will never want to repent. And if you are a believer, if you profess to be a believer, this should chill your soul tonight. Consider a man like Judas who followed our Lord for three years, heard the most profound and powerful preacher, whoever was, as this text says, he tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. He was named as one of Jesus' apostles in Luke chapter 6. You remember that, boys and girls, not too long ago. He had preached the gospel. He had even performed miracles as one of the twelve. Yet, he was proven reprobate, the betrayer of Jesus, and he never sought repentance, friends, He even had a natural kind of sorrow, which was not godly sorrow, when he threw back his blood money, right? But he never found it in himself to throw himself back at the mercy of Jesus Christ. Apostasy for him was irreversible. And the purpose of our text in Hebrews 6 tonight is to give you a solemn warning. It is to deter you from playing around with the fire of unbelief in view of apostasies horror, that you might examine yourself, brethren. The idea is is not to be so crushed today. Well, maybe if you don't have saving faith, you realize you've been a hypocrite all your life and you've never really come to the Lord, then today may be the day of salvation for you. But for you who believe, friends, that as you examine your relationship to the Lord, you might examine yourself and be confident as the apostle is in the ninth verse of Hebrews 6 and say that, He is persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation that you would say, I am persuaded, no, I am not an apostate, I'm not on the road to apostasy, and that salvation is mine. But if you are flirting with unbelief, that you would turn away from it, lest you find yourself on the road to apostasy. You have to see that Jesus, if you are here and you're hearing this preached, Jesus is pleading with you in this text. Will you also go away? Will you go away as so many have? That's the sad truth. So many have walked away from the Lord. That comes out of John chapter 6 when many couldn't accept his hard word. And you have to say, you have to examine your heart. You must see the horror of apostasy this afternoon and say to the Lord, to whom shall I go, Lord? I have no other hope but you. Friends, few themes in the word of God are as important as this one. Your soul, and I don't say this lightly, hangs in the balance before God, before this text. If you're here tonight, if you're listening to this, it is not too late for you. If you have a concern about being an apostate, you can praise God today and you can repent and return and you must do so. But you are being warned against apostasy by this text because of its horror. And so our theme is a warning against apostasy, a warning against falling away from Jesus Christ. And we'll consider that under three headings tonight. First is apostasy, its real danger. 
Second, it's nominal faith. And third, it's a cursed fruit. First, apostasy. It's real danger. Let's uh, first define apostasy for a moment. Verse 6 calls it a falling away. Richard Muller defines it as the willful rejection of Christ by one who has been a Christian. And I think that's very helpful. It's a willful rejection. I have once professed that Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners. I have once said that there is no hope for me. There is no hope for me other than the blood of Jesus Christ which taketh away the sin of the world. And now I willfully reject all of that. And I walk away. And that's why it is very hard for one who knows the gospel message to understand how they could ever come back after rejecting this. And of course, this is the very context of the epistle to the Hebrews. Here are souls that were tempted to fall away from Jesus Christ, to abandon him. For what? The Old Testament system that was passing away with its types and its shadows and its, its bulls and its goats, with its human high priests. They were moving in the direction of rejecting Jesus Christ, his atoning work and his priesthood. They were going for the types and the shadows when the substance Jesus Christ had come. They were ready to walk away from Christ. And while that is specific apostasy for them, apostasy takes all kinds of forms today. An apostate may fall away from Christ to follow philosophy and atheism. Usually, right, it's to gratify their sin. It's not because of an intellectual problem. It's because I want a certain kind of sin, and I'm going to go and find philosophies that enable it. They love their sin more than their professed love for Christ. They're done hearing this kind of thing. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. They're done hearing it. And so they go and chase philosophy and atheism. Like the rich young ruler, they walk away from Jesus when he gives a command that is too hard for them, their flesh. Or an apostate may, and you see this at times as well, fall to a false religion like Islam or Judaism. There are also other Christian cults, apostates that claim they still believe in Jesus, but have fallen away from him because they went to works-based cults that deny salvation is of grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone, or they deny the divinity of Christ. And so apostates are found among those who fall away from evangelical or orthodox churches to Mormonism or the Jehovah's Witnesses. There are apostates. Or those who go to those who preach another gospel, which is no gospel at all, like the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. And so these two are apostates. In every case, they fall away from the true Jesus Christ and his perfect atoning work. Which is why verse 6 says, Apostates crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. They shame his perfection and they shame his work. And we'll get there later, but they fundamentally deny the person and work of Jesus Christ. So if that gives us a small taste of the apostate, you must see the danger of it. Apostasy, unbelief, friends, is not something to dabble in. Absolutely not. It is impossible to recover from. Our text says in verses 4 through 6, For it is impossible... For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, apostasy, to renew them again unto repentance. It says it is impossible for one who has professed the gospel hope at one time, professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the true Jesus, one who has professed that, who falls away to be renewed again unto repentance. In what sense is it impossible? Well, the apostle, of course, speaks as a man, right? Man cannot recover themselves out of apostasy or of falling out from Christ. And yes, all things are possible with God. The things that are impossible with God are poss- uh, with man are possible with God, Luke 18, 27. And so some who appear to be apostates, may have been backsliders, right? They say they've abandoned the faith. They may just have been terrible backsliders, not total apostates, sure. You might quibble here and there. You might say, I know this example here and there. 
You might say, well, maybe they weren't really an apostate. Maybe they're a deep backslide. I don't know what their condition is. But friends, what I want to tell you is forget about all that. You need to forget about all of that. The Holy Ghost has no time for that kind of nuance here in this text. None whatsoever. You need to take him for yourself at face value. You need to say for yourself, if I go apart from Christ, I am never, ever returning. That is the warning to you. Regardless of what God may you perceive have done with someone else, for you, the warning today is this. You leave Jesus, you're not coming back. This means for you, you must believe today that apostasy will be irreversible. In 1 John 5.16, we hear of a sin unto death. That means it is an irreversible sin. Apostasy. In Jude 12, you read of men who are twice dead. Those are apostates. Why are they twice dead? Because all living men are born dead in their trespasses and sins, Ephesians 2.1. And so all men are once dead. But the living who make a profession of faith and renounce it are twice dead. And we cannot expect them to repent of their abandonment of Jesus. Boys and girls, if you hear nothing else tonight, you need to hear that to renounce Jesus will likely be fatal to you. It will be fatal to your soul. When you are tempted to renounce Christ... As you leave your parents' home, especially, you will be tempted in a great way. You'll be tempted for the world's love. You'll be tempted for popularity with the world. You'll be tempted for the love and pursuit of certain sins. You need to remember this word from the Lord. Jesus said, Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 10, 33. You need to take that seriously. And that needs to be to you such such a barrier to apostasy, you will not even think about it once, you will not entertain it, and it will never ever be a temptation you will play with. Now there are two erroneous views on this text that we must reject. We have to survey that. You have to be aware of it because you might hold one of these views or know somebody who does. And you must see that these views are deadly wrong and you must reject them. The first view is that this text is hypothetical. That view must be rejected. That is usually found in the camp that is called once saved, always saved. It teaches you that if you have ever, ever made a profession of faith at youth camp or in one of those stadiums with the so-called crusade, if you've ever made a profession of faith, you are secure and secure forever. It does not matter if you live a reprobate life, you will be saved because at one point you prayed maybe a prayer like the sinner's prayer. This text deals a death blow to that theology. That's why those people want to say this is a hypothetical warning, but not a real one. You need to abandon that view, friends. Many hear that and are deceived. They live reprobate lives, never hearing of the warning of 2 Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. There are so many who have thought they are eternally secure because they made a decision for Christ and have maybe a card in their their Bible that they had stamped by some minister. But they are shocked when they awaken in hell after hearing the words, Depart from me, I never knew you. What? Ye that work iniquity. So reject the hypothetical view that a person who ever makes a profession of faith is saved forever. The second view to reject is that those who teach that true believers can be lost. That's the Arminian or free will view of salvation, and it must be totally rejected. Because one who is born again, you think of this, just even the the expression, right? One who is born again can never be unborn. True believers who are born again will endure. Because the Bible says to those born again, you must be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.6. The Bible says that those with saving faith, that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1.5. True believers never apostatize. It is impossible for them to because... God keeps them. 
And so we must reject the Arminian conception of the text as well. So what is the right view? Well, it is to treat this as a warning to those who never truly receive Jesus Christ by faith. It warns you who have made an outward profession of faith but have never been born again, who have never had a new heart, who have never been regenerated, that you've never had a heart that trusts Jesus Christ alone for salvation, no matter what you have said, no matter what decision you have made at one point because of the exertion or influence of someone else. These are not hearts that loathe sin and love righteousness. That's not found in these hearts. These are hearts that do not adore Jesus Christ. These are hearts that do not make a habit of repentance and faith. These are some who might even endure outward forms of religion, but will never endure a heart religion. That's who these are. This text is warning hypocrites, those who are not true believers. And that's the view that matches what we call the perseverance of the saints. That true, real believers endure to the end and never fall away from Jesus Christ, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. What a blessing that is to you who truly know the Lord by faith. You endure because the power of God will never let you go. And the fact that your faith endures shows the instrumentality of faith in that. That true faith is instrumental in the power of God through faith unto salvation. And that's why you endure. It is the power of God working in you. But this text is given to warn you who have no saving faith but a counterfeit faith. For you, apostasy is a tremendous danger. Because it is likely you are on that road. And we must all be aware. We must all ask, is my faith the faith of demons. James wrote that the demons, the devils also believe and tremble. James 2.19. They know there is a God. They know there is a Redeemer. They can even say with greater clarity than I can from the pulpit how the two natures of Christ perfectly meet in one person. They can tell you very plainly all about the hypostatic union and they hate all of it. They hate all of it. There is a certain kind of faith that is just by the lips and not in the heart. But saving faith rests in Christ alone, and resting in Christ seeks to follow him. This is a vital question for you all. Can you say, I rest in Jesus Christ alone? I rest in Christ alone. Can you say to Jesus, to whom shall I go but thee? Can you say, oh my soul, I am chilled when Jesus says, remember Lot's wife? Can you say to Jesus, yes, denying myself is hard on my flesh, but oh, I would rather deny myself than abandon you. Give me the grace to deny myself and give me mercy to forgive my lack of denial. If so, praise God. These are marks and evidences of saving grace exercising repentance and faith. The Holy Ghost wants to warn you. Apostates have at some point experienced a kind of nominal but not true saving faith. And that's our second heading, apostasy, it's nominal faith. In our text, you will find six marks of the nominal faith of apostates. Despite them, and these are very good counterfeits, despite them, they fall away. You must know them so that you don't rest in them, but instead rest in Christ truly, that you know him from the heart, knowing also that a resting in Christ has you work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God is at work in you. These six marks of nominal faith are found, rather, in what the Puritans would once call the almost Christian. That's a term derived from Acts 26, 28, when Agrippa told Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. The almost Christian. The almost Christian appears to be heading towards heaven, but they end up falling far, far short of it and falling into hell. Why is that? They were never truly regenerate. They deceived themselves. They're not those that our confession says truly believe in the Lord Jesus and love him in sincerity, endeavoring to walk in all good conscience before him, And so, in this life, these 
can be certainly assured they are in the state of grace. Confession of Faith 18.1, you can look at the scripture proofs for that. And next week, that will be more of our, our theme on assurance. But I want to bring home a, a, a apostasy today. This is a heavy subject. But let me preface this because it is a sad thing that we've forgotten this, especially in our church climate. Ours is a weighty faith, and don't you dare forget it. Ours is a weighty faith. We are not playing around here. Not at all. We are not playing school right now. It is not social hour. Our faith deals with eternal matters, friend. We deal with our eternal destiny. We deal with hell. We deal with heaven. We deal with the glorious God of heaven. It deals with our awful sins against him, the great and good God. It deals with a faith so, so weighty, you think of this, that a God-man redeemer was crucified for our sin that we might be saved. Ours is a weighty faith. Don't ever think of it as anything else. Never lose a sense of how weighty the matters of the Bible are. As soon as you stop taking your faith seriously as a weighty thing, as soon as you stop keeping Jesus Christ ever before you, you are heading on the road to apostasy. You're making that first step towards backsliding and you forget the fear of God and the holiness of God. And what precious Redeemer you have in Jesus. So let us carefully now consider these six marks of a nominal faith. The first mark is that apostates were once enlightened, verse 4. This is not the renewing of the mind that comes by regeneration in Romans 12, 2. But instead, this is a kind of natural enlightenment instead. What the apostate has known is he has known the way of salvation. Maybe somebody's opened the book of Romans and has gone through, as they they call that Romans road, right, that leads you to an understanding of salvation in the book of Romans. And the apostate has known it. They know that Christ Jesus has come to save sinners. They know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him uh, should not perish but have everlasting life. But while they have had a head knowledge of these things, a knowledge residing in facts and figures, They have never had an inward experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ. And for apostates who have known all this about Christ, the Bible says, and be warned, greater judgment awaits for you. You are liable for what you have known and you have rejected. Peter wrote in 2 Peter 2, 21 through 22, of the apostate, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is returned, is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Better for you, friend, not to have known the way of salvation than to reject it. You reject it. What an awful thing it will be to come before God and say, I rejected the precious Lamb of God, your only begotten Son, you are well pleased, you are well pleased in. I have known that salvation requires the shedding of the precious blood of God, and I have said no to all of that. In Luke twelve forty seven, and that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. It's a dangerous thing to be here week in after week out, friends but never receive Christ for yourself and submit yourself to him. The second mark is apostates have tasted of the heavenly gift, verse 4 again. I mean, they dabble in religion. You know, they taste religion. They've taken a taste of the gospel, the heavenly gift, a a kind of superficial sort of, you might use the, the analogy of dipping your toe into the water. The almost Christian tastes religion for a time, and they seem to even like it well enough. I've run into this. You have probably too if you've been in the church for any length of time. A person who seems to be on fire for the Lord for a brief period of time, and then you turn around and you go, where are they in the church? They haven't even contacted anyone. And you find out that they are not in any church, and they have totally abandoned the faith. And you go, how did this happen? This person seemed to be in love with the Bible and seemed to love the things of God. They do not endure, they do not persevere, and what they say is eventually, and it usually comes at a crossroads, when they learn something of Jesus' will for them, and they say, well, I guess Jesus is not for me. And as they see the depth of the commitment of the Christian, they say, I have better things to do. 
I have better things to do than be one of those fanatics who are going to follow Jesus. And so they leave. And sometimes you find people like this. They come, they come to taste religion, sort of like the man that I spoke of in the morning sermon, that they sometimes come in their distress. And then when they receive health or a new job or whatever they were really after, then they leave, having come to Christ under false pretenses. And I pray that is not you, friend, either. The third mark, also in verse 4, is that they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is not speaking of the Holy Ghost regenerating a soul, because a soul that's regenerated is born again and will never be lost. But instead, and this makes me tremble as a minister, there are some common operations of the Spirit, even spiritual giftings that you find in the Bible. For instance, you have men in the Bible like Balaam in Numbers 24 where the Spirit of God comes on him and his eyes are open. That's what the text said. His eyes are opened for a brief time to prophesy. Or King Saul, where it was one asked of, once asked of him, is Saul among the prophets? 1 Samuel 10, 11. Or similarly, and this really should chill us, Matthew 7, 22 to 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, in this life, sometimes the Spirit does work through the reprobate. Our confession calls those common operations of the Spirit. This is why also, this is a different controversy, the Donatist controversy from a long time ago. This is why, again, the ministry even of a reprobate man is not invalid, in a sense, in terms of that grace was really being ministered to you through that man because it's the Spirit that was ministering to you if you have had spiritual fruit. Sometimes you'll say, I was converted under a man that I later found out was a reprobate. Well, this is what it is, common operations of the Spirit. But it is the Spirit... Pleased to work through a reprobate man. Well, what this all teaches us then is to examine ourselves, right? Don't rest in your works. Don't rest in your works, child of God, but rest in Christ alone. Say, my hope is found that I have put all of my hopes in Jesus Christ. I am not going to say, because I have preached the gospel, then the Lord is going to receive me into heaven. In fact, I am, I am guilty of more stripes if I don't truly come to the Lord through faith. Friends, if I preach the gospel to you and have never trusted in Christ myself, how great my condemnation will be, even if you are converted under this ministry here. But he also teaches in Matthew 7, 22, uh, 23, that one of the marks of resting in Christ is you don't love iniquity, but you love righteousness. You know, some men, they enjoy being in the pulpit. Or they enjoy all their works of service. And it's often because men get to look at them and shower praise on them. But Jesus Christ says that the mark of the true believer is that you don't work iniquity. You don't love iniquity. Unlike the apostate. The fourth mark of the apostate is they have tasted the good word of God. Verse 5. This echoes the parable of the soils. That some sit under the word and preaching for a little while. But then you find that the word has not taken root. You recall in our reading of Luke 8.13, and listen carefully, that some seed is sown on the rock, which when they hear, receive the word with joy. And these have no root, which for a while believe and in time of temptation fall away. Do you receive that? Do you see that? That some receive the word with joy. With joy. And they believe for a time, but in the time of temptation, They fall away. These are the same words as Hebrews 6. They fall away. The same word for apostates. So what must you be today if you are here and are not an apostate? Jesus says you must be good ground. They which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, what? Keep it and bring fruit with patience. Luke 8, 15. An honest and good heart, a regenerated heart, It hears the word, and yes, it has joy at the word, but more important than that, it also keeps the word, and it brings fruit with patience. There's that word, it endures. It endures, it perseveres, it is constant with Christ, come what may. Even when our flesh gets in the way, it endures. Okay, Lord, I I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God. I repent, but I will persevere. I will continue to pursue the will of God. It doesn't give up. It continues. 
The fifth mark is in verse 5 as well. They have tasted the powers of the world to come. Apostates have heard of the glories to come. They've heard of the new heavens and the new earth. They hear, hear that Jesus Christ will return again in power and glory. That one day sin will be put away and saints will dwell with the Lamb of God. That the time is coming even. They have heard such things as this. That the Lamb of God will wipe away all the tears of every saint. And yet, they have come to reject all of this. You know, the thing is, everything I have said, it fills the regenerated soul with longing, doesn't it? Do you long for this? Do you long for your sin nature to be fully removed one day? Do you long for the wedding supper of the Lamb? Do you long for the day when the hand of Jesus will wipe away your every tear? Do you long for that day when you will dwell with an unimaginable glory in the beatific vision as you get to know your God perfectly for all eternity? If you do, bless the Lord. That is the work of regeneration. So think of how irredeemable an apostate is, one who knows all of this glory in the mind and says, no, I'm going to walk away from all of that. I'm going to walk away from the glories to come. I find it in my heart to do that. Do you see why this is an irredeemable kind of sin, friends? How it is that the apostate who can know these things who has tasted the powers of the world to come, the glories that await, would walk away and say no to Jesus Christ. It's an awful thing. The sixth mark is apostates have formally repented once outwardly. Verse 6 says, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance. Meaning they had repented of a kind. Maybe they have admitted, as we saw this morning, I am a sinner publicly. But it was never true repentance in the almost Christian, in the apostate. Theirs is the never kind of godly repentance. And look at that chapter, well, child of God. 2 Corinthians 7, I preached on it not too long ago. You can review that if you wish. Their repentance never produced godly sorrow. There was never indignation at themselves. I have sinned against God. There was never vehemence saying, I see how ugly this sin is. And there's never vehemence targeting that sin. I want to stop it. There's never a fear that they would commit it against a holy God again. There's never a zeal in turning away from it and so on. Look at those marks of godly repentance. Godly sorrow for sin, true repentance wrought by the Spirit. You have to ask, is your life a habit of this? Don't say, well, I repented once in the stadium, or I repented once and I got my, my uh, ticket to heaven stamped by the person who was preaching. Is this the habit of my soul? Does your sin, does your sin bother you, not just because of the effect it has had on your life, but because it is against your holy God? Does your sin trouble your heart? Do you lament with Psalm 51 to God, against thee and thee only have I sinned? The apostate never did any of that. They formally repented of sin, but they never truly from the heart. Now having heard these six marks, can you see why it is the case? It is impossible to recover these. How hard is that heart that has tasted these things and then repudiates them? In verse 6, we hear that those who fall away from all this crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Beloved, how can you deny Jesus Christ after knowing the gospel, after knowing His glorious person and His gracious work and turn away from Him? How can you know Him and turn away? That is to put Him to open shame as though you join those that crucified him, those who beheld the Lord of glory. You think of those men, right? We, we recently, uh, I preached on behold the man. These are the men who beheld the Lord of glory face to face and instead of love found hate for him, beating him, scourging him. That's apostasy. And can you ever, ever imagine returning from that place? Is it not a just judgment from God when apostates never return? It is. 
So let it be known to you all. This is what God thinks of you if you fall away. That you put his son to open shame. And how great will his wrath be. The father loves the son. Oh, how he loves his beloved son. And how terrible will the judgment be on apostates for eternity. For Judas's. How wrathful God is to them who reject his only begotten son. Though they know that he gave that he who is most precious for sinners who deserve hell to have heaven and they reject him. How dreadful the fate of apostates is. How terrible the judgment is that comes on you who will reject Jesus in this place. You put the son of God to open shame. I can scarcely imagine what the pains of hell will be like for eternity to those who do. You don't believe there's a special place in hell reserved for this or that, though there are different judgments. The people who renounce Jesus Christ will suffer the worst torments of all. The reason you will never be able to regain U.S. citizenship if you renounce it is the utter contempt that you have shown the United States government. How much worse is it then for you to show contempt to God's son and renounce him? Never entertain the idea that God will bring you back. So we conclude with our final heading, apostasy, it's a cursed fruit. And so our text is a warning, Christian, to work out your faith with fear and trembling, to show you that a nominal Christianity is no Christianity, and it leads to apostasy to exhort you to be reborn completely through saving faith in Jesus Christ, a faith that will demonstrate it is rooted in Christ through the fruit it generates. So verse 7 and 8 contrast the believer and the apostate. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. You'll notice this text is very similar to Jesus' parable of the soils, isn't it? That's why we read it. The apostate bears thorns and briars in the soils of their life, and they will be burned with Christ's unquenchable fire, just as John the Baptist preached. They bear those evil fruits of an unbelieving heart. 2 Peter 2, 14 through 15 speaks of apostates like this. And look at the fruit of their lives. Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Look at that list. This is the fruit of apostasy. The heart of apostates is not exercised towards righteousness, but towards sin. They forsake the right way and follow Balaam, who himself had common operation of the Spirit. Balaam, like Balaam, apostates love unrighteousness. That's why he, the Lord says, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. Regardless of your profession of faith, if you cherish a love for sin, you are backsliding at the very least and on the road to apostasy at the very worst. Perhaps you haven't been born again. If you cherish and love sin, this is a warning to you. But in contrast here, true believers have a fruitful faith. Their ground takes in the rain of the word and the water of the spirit and it brings forth herbs, blessed of God and delightful to the Lord. If 1 Peter 2 showed us what comes from the unbeliever, you can look later the Sabbath day in contrast to 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8, that shows us what comes out of the believer. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance or self-control, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what you long for. This is what you pray for. This is what, even as I said it, right? We know our flesh, right, is contrary to these things. But certainly there is a part of you, believer, that longed for this. Certainly there is a part of you, believer, that longed for this. 
These are the good fruits of the saved soul, and that is what you must cultivate. All by the grace of God, take in the ordinances, prayer, the word, the sacraments, as rain from heaven, because that's what it is. And exercise those ordinances and the grace they give to produce these fruits. And if these things be in you, you can be assured you are no reprobate and you are no apostate. Second Peter 1, 9 through 11 continues. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, this is where we know this text, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Make your calling and election sure, all of you. Exercise yourself to godliness. Now, I don't want to leave us just here, though we will continue in this vein with assurance next week, but in, the, in light of the fact that some of you may not be here, even with this warning, Paul was persuaded that the Hebrews were not apostates. In verse 9 he said, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Why was he persuaded? Because he saw spiritual fruit in them. The things he says that accompany salvation. The fruit of a true interest in Christ. Signs that they were engrafted into the vine Jesus Christ and they had a saving union with him. But why this warning about apostasy if he was persuaded of their perseverance? And this must be, for, for you as well, something to take to heart. Because warnings against apostasy are a means by which the saints will persevere. They are spurred on to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Because so often we are lax, friends, in the faith. And we must hear of the road that leads to apostasy, that we would turn away from it and live for Christ and be diligent in the faith. Consider verses 11 and 12. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That'll be our theme next time. But you must listen to this. Spur yourself on to inherit the promises through faith and patience. The apostate does not cling to the promises of God through faith and patience. See, this is why the parable of the soil says they receive the word with joy. Maybe they hear the promise of God, but then temptation comes and their endurance is over. Our faith is a faith that requires patience and endurance, friends. The true believer clings to the promises of God in Jesus Christ, come what may. Their only hope is found in the promise of God in Christ and they cling to him. Yes, sometimes... Sometimes, like Peter, they fall. It seems like they fall away. They deny him for a time, but they always are found right back with Christ. They have a full assurance of hope in Christ. They are diligent, you hear this, in waiting on his promise. His promise will come. It's a promise. What you must do is be diligent in waiting on the Lord. That is an exercise of saving faith. If you are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, your faith holds on to the promises of God, desperately so, and it endures even when the storms of life come. You're diligent. You're not slothful in that waiting. They open their Bible, it says, to follow those who inherited the promises, as in Hebrews 11, and they exercise their souls to godliness. And in so doing, they endure to the end. And they persevere with hope in Christ, with faith in Christ, drinking in the grace of God through his ordinances and bear fruit and persevere. And so they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. 1 Peter 1, verse 5. But for you who are here tonight, who may be afraid of apostasy, I say fear of apostasy is good. If you're afraid, good. Because the apostate really doesn't care. You can take Jesus or leave him. The simplest test, mark it well, keep this close to your heart all the days of your life. The simplest test anyone could administer to you tonight, which is really God administering to this, is a simple question. But one, Jesus asked his disciples. 
will ye also go away? Will ye also go away? He asks you the question through the preached word now. Will ye also go away? Will you leave me, beloved? Will you fall away like Judas? Will something in the world take your affections from me? Will you walk away from me for anything? Is there anything that can be dangled in front of you? Can a billion dollars be dangled in front of you right now? Can your life even be dangled in front of you? And would you say, I will walk away from Jesus so I can save even my own life? Will you fall away like Judas? Or will you cling to me like Peter? Does your heart sink at the thought of abandoning Christ? Would you be okay without his blessed presence for all eternity? Is your pain tonight not thinking of the pain of hell, but the greater pain of eternally being away from Christ's shining face? If you can say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And I believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the test, friend. That is the ultimate test. Say with conviction and resolve, there'll be another chapter on apostasy in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 39, use it and say, I am not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So I beg all of you, you heard this morning that the minister is God's ambassador. Do not draw away from Christ. Never tear up your citizenship to the kingdom of heaven. It'll be irrevocable. Instead, keep the faith, endure, and to the saving of your soul, ever looking unto Jesus, who is your only hope. May he help you do it, and me too. Amen. Please rise for prayer, if able. O oh Lord, our God, what a dreadful thing is the apostate's future. Pray, Father, that none here would ever leave Christ. That as they think of Christ's words, they would say, oh, how could I ever abandon you, Lord? That they would embrace the Lord Jesus Christ with all their heart, that you would give them the grace to do it. And Father, if any here are on the road to backsliding and to apostasy, would you grab their hearts? Would you use the preached word and the word of God that they have heard to grab them back? That they would not be apostates, but instead they would run back run back to the Lord, and that you, Father, would embrace them. Give them the grace to repent and to return to you, Father. We pray, Father, that you would keep all of us. Keep us from playing with unbelief. Keep us from toying around with sin. Keep us from loving anything else more than we love the Savior. O oh, Lord our God, we pray that each of us here would come before your throne on the day you call us to yourself and not here depart from me, but instead, we would here enter into the joy of the Lord. O oh, Father, this is our hope. We cling to the promises of Christ. Keep us by the power of God through faith unto salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.